Guys, I want to thank the following sponsors of the podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, my friend Cody Nelson of 25 plus years. He, I call him the glassing guru. He's the optics authority. He's the optics manager at GoHunt.com Gear Shop. If you guys have any interest in purchasing optics at all or have any questions, give Cody a call directly at 702-847-8747. That's extension 2. You can also email him directly at optics at gohunt.com or call him or text him on his cell phone, 602-399-3699. I want to thank Go Hunt Optics Department uh, for their sponsorship of this podcast. I also want to thank the Go Hunt Insider. Remind you guys that if you go to gohunt.com forward slash jscott, you're going to get a $50 Go Hunt Gear Shop gift card just for signing up. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. You can find out more about Kuyu, which is the gear Gear that I wear on all of my uh, hunts. I uh, also wear it on my fishing trips. Uh, pretty much everything I wear you can go to k- their website, which is kuyu.com, k u i u.com, uh, to find out more. It's also a direct to consumer website, so you won't find this in any retailers. You can order directly off the website. Go to kuyu.com, k u i u.com. Uh, phonescope.com use the jscott20 promo code you're going to get a 10 percent discount on all orders guys i also want to tell you about a new sponsor of the podcast kyle lynch who's also a former army ranger who served with the 2nd battalion the 75th ranger regiment in iraq and Af- afghanistan uh, kyle has also been a deputy sheriff and volunteer firefighter and he is really involved on the tactical side. Uh, he is actually co-owner of a company based in Georgia uh, called Armageddon Gear. Uh, they do a ton of stuff that serves the military and commercial tactical and competitive shooting markets. Uh, but he has designed a really cool elk call carrier. And he's launched a new website called allelk.com. Uh, Go check out the Bugle Mule. The Bugle Mule is a mouth call, elk call carrier uh, that is, um, he's made it where it fits right out on the outside of a bugle tube. It carries up to three calls. Uh, Go check it out at allelk.com. For a limited time, the J. Scott Outdoors uh, podcast listeners can get a 10% discount there at allelk.com. Put in the promo code JSO10 for 10% off. I want to thank allelk.com. I want to thank Kyle for his service to our country. And I want to thank him for the sponsorship of this podcast. Guys, without these podcast sponsors, uh, I wouldn't be able to put the amount of time that I do into this. Uh, So I want to thank them and I want to thank you. Let's get right into the episode. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have good friend Steve Chappell of Elk Camp TV, Chapel Guide Service on the line. Steve, how you doing? I'm doing real good today, Jay. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, you know, buddy, this is kind of that time of year that uh, I know as elk hunters, you and I, uh, we always look forward to, but it's always kind of this time frame, you know, about 15 days out, so to speak, from, you know, the magical month of September when we're thinking and trying to get all our stuff done for elk. All we can think about is elk, but there's lots of other things with other businesses and stuff we got going that we know we got to, you know, get all that stuff done before we can enjoy the, the elk bugling. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're kind of in the same state of, of mind that I'm in. Is that is that a safe assumption? Yes, absolutely, Jay. I, I feel like I'm going five dip, different directions at once, but what I look forward to the most about elk season these days and elk camp is that it just feels like a vacation to me anymore. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, I hunt hard and I take it serious, but I, I like to have fun. And, you know, the day that it becomes not fun anymore is, is the day that I'm going to reconsider doing it. But I do. I just really view it as just a getaway from life. And um, yeah. I just wish it would happen more often, but I guess it wouldn't be so special to us if we could do it all the time. Yeah, you know, someone's asked me before, they're like, don't you wish elk bugled all year long? And, you know, at first I was like, yeah, that would be incredible. But actually I've kind of changed my answer and it's like, no, I kind of like it that it's about a, you know, 30 to 45 day type of window. And, you know, obviously you with your um, 
uh, elk operation in Colorado, you sometimes get a 60-day window, you know, a little bit more opportunity. But the reality is if they bugled all the time and we got to interact and, you know, do everything that we do in September, it would probably not be as special. It probably would get old. And that's one thing I really like about elk season is you can be so fired up and energetic about that and then they stop bugling and you kind of transition to, you know, whether it be deer hunting or sheep hunting or, you know, going back to work or whatever it might be. It just, it kind of gives you a chance to go all in for about a 30 day window and, and enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. And then always the planning process starts, you know, if you feel a little road weary and tired after all the elk hunting, you know, especially, you know, like me going through quite a few seasons, it's amazing just after about a week I find myself missing it and already thinking and planning about next year and then talking to people on the phone about elk hunting and applying for Arizona. So it's just kind of a nonstop process. But I agree with you. If the elk bugled year-round, I think it would lose its, its uh, glimmer just a little bit. It's something that we need to look forward to every year and um it, because then it would just become normal ho-hum life if that happened all the time so i, I love how god made it <laughs> yeah for sure steve um let's dive into we're, we're going to answer a bunch of questions here uh but before we get into that i want to have a little chat uh about your upcoming season i believe you're going to be personally in spending time in unit one in arizona uh for the first part of your elk season and obviously in uh, Colorado for your operation you, you and your dad have there. Um, talk a little bit about uh, what you have upcoming uh, with with the Unit 1 hunt. How is it looking, forecast? Uh, you know, talk a little bit about all of that. Yeah, Jay, as we talked about earlier, um, you know, it was definitely dry all last fall, winter, spring, clear in, into summer. But thankfully, we've really picked up some awesome moisture in northern Arizona. You know, lots of, most of northern Arizona picked up great moisture uh, since July has, has hit, uh, Unit 1 especially. Uh, you know, I've been there a couple of times uh, since July, and it is, it is really greened up. It's taken on a whole new look. Um, you know, so I'm really excited about it. I really think that even though antler growth is not going to be max this year, I, I really feel like the rut was saved by all that moisture, and with this green up, the elk are going to get healthy, and so we should have good bugling and rutting action, so it should be normal in that aspect, and so that's what I'm most excited about. Talk a little bit about when we get these widespread rains across these units um, for, for guys that are going into not only these Arizona hunts, but, you know, I was just at the Odd Six Ranch, and since June, you know, it's greened up since, you know, the last time I was there, it's really greened up. And um, talk a little bit about what that overall green up does across those units and what people would expect, you know, as far as, you know, trying to find elk um, and, you know, from a strategy standpoint, um, what some of those summer green ups mean. Sure, you bet. And, you know, in some units, especially in units like 9 and 10, Historically, these uh, summer monsoon rains will hit kind of spotty and streaky sometimes in places. Now, a person would have to, you know, go to their unit and, fi and find that out. Um, but sometimes it'll kind of hit streaky, and what you need to do is you need to go and scout and find that out because the elk are definitely going to congregate where the green up is better and where the ponds, the tanks have filled up with water. Um, that's where you're going to find your cow-calf groups. They always seem especially to be in the sweeter spots of the unit, so to speak, where the feed is better. And, uh, you know, when the bulls, when they start feeling the rut, they're going to go join up with those cow-calf groups. So that's where you're going to find the action. Um, I kind of feel like a unit like one, especially this year with the rains being pretty widespread and consistent. I mean, I look at the forecast for the next 10 days, and it's mostly rain all the way through so I feel like in a unit like that the elk are going to be widespread throughout the unit then it's more of a matter of picking out the type of terrain and habitat that you want to hunt in and especially on the bow hunt I'm looking for, for terrain that I can call in um, you know if it's stuff in unit one that's too burned I, I, I would typically try to avoid because there's going to be a lot of blowdowns and the elk can look and see you from long distances and it makes it difficult um, so I'm a little biased as a caller. I'm wanting country that's, 
you know, just a little on the, more on the thicker side, so I'm able to get tight with the elk and call to them and call them in and have those close interactions. So that's kind of how I approach it when the, you know, the entire unit could be greened up. Yeah, I mean, uh, with, with it greening up, and, it, you know, you talk about 9 and 10, and for those listeners that don't know Arizona 9 and 10, those are typically arid units. Um, not any live water, pretty much rely on Arizona Game of Fish drinkers, pretty much rely on dirt stock tanks built by ranchers and such. Um, when, you're, when you're in those arid units, and, you know, New Mexico um, has a bunch of those units uh, as well, um, even Nevada, even southern Utah, some of those places, um, yeah. you know, you, you, it's important that you realize that if you have those rains that are spotty like you talk about, it creates what, you know, you just said, little sweet spots in those units. But if you get pretty widespread moisture all throughout the unit, in other words, in my mind, it spreads those elk out. In other words, you could get up on big high knobs and kind of see elk all over, and you don't see those big clumps and congregations uh, of elk. My question would be, from a behavioral standpoint and a bugling you know, I feel like sometimes on these dry years or even on spotty rain years where it's real green in certain spots, I'm um, curious mm-hmm. your feedback on this, like it'll cl- clump those elk up and actually they'll get to redding, they'll get to bugling, they'll get kind of in that frenzy, so to speak. Um, and then sometimes when you have real widespread rains, it, it spreads everything out. And then sometimes, the, in my opinion, the, the rut can be a little bit of a lull starting out. It, it, it seems slow, like they're not just going crazy. Talk a little bit about your experiences with some of that same stuff. Absolutely, Jay. That's what I've experienced to the T. I knew right where you were going with that, and I, I completely agree. When you have widespread moisture and widespread green up, it tends to spread elk out. Therefore, you don't have the concentrations and especially concentrations of bulls around those cow-calf groups, creating that competition that causes them to really bugle and fight and have a very active rut. It, yeah, it just seems like when they're really spread out and there's not you know, multiple bulls hassling a herd bull over his cows, he's going to tend to be a lot quieter about things as in, in my experience. So, you know, sometimes... The widespread storms are a blessing, and other times, that, like you say, it can slow things down and make it just really seem stalled out, especially at the early part of the hunt. Um, I think, you know, on, on years like this, especially uh, if it's widespread, it may take us getting into, say, the third week of September before things crank up, maybe even 24th, 25th of the month. Um, so, yeah, guys who have tags like, say, in 7 West, <laughs> I thought all along that that hunt is timed very well for guys with that hunt that starts a week later. So uh, yeah. I'll be anxious to see and hear how that hunt goes down this year. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, 7 West has the, the firearm season in, in front this year. Um, and while I think that, is it muzzleloader or rifle? I'm not sure, but it could be a phenomenal hunt. Muzzleloader, you know, if you found a big bull, but I have a feeling that those people that, you know, I think there's 20 or 25 tags, whatever there is, I think it's going to be a little bit of a slow go. And so if you have one of those early muzzleloader hunts in 7 West, that would be a perfect example of, like, make sure you do a bunch of scouting, you know, ahead of the season and, you know, take a week off before the season if you can and get up there and try and figure out where the bull you want to kill is um, because with it being, you know, fairly widespread moisture and I'm betting probably the first week a little bit of slow bugling in 7 uh, West, you know, it, 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 even though you can shoot further, um, I, I'm thinking that archery hunt might actually be the best hunt for, you know, bugling and, and probably having an interaction with a bunch of elk. So, um, Steve, I, I want to kind of segue here and talk a little. Well, before I do that, um, I want to ask you about Elk Camp TV, uh, which I have been taping on um, my TV, I guess, through TiVo or whatever we, we use. My wife handles all of that. But, um I've been enjoying the show. Talk a little bit about, maybe for the listeners that don't know, uh, about your show on the Sportsman's Channel and how it's going. Yeah, thank you, Jay. It's uh, called Elk Camp, and it started on July 2nd. So 
so it's been going for about five weeks now. I believe we're actually on the seventh episode right now. There's there's ten episodes, so for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, the nice thing is is that after all ten episodes air, they will they will start over again and rerun in the second quarter. So there's the opportunity to watch them all again. Um, basically, half of those episodes are from Arizona. They're archery, uh, muzzleloader, early rifle. So you've got everything there. They're all rut hunts with bugling and calling elk in and, you know, close interaction. So, so that's a neat aspect of it. And then the other half are from Colorado, from our place where I guide with my dad. Um, you know, those are good hunts as well, the elk are bugling. A little bit different because it doesn't lend itself quite as much to calling and, you know, close interaction. We're hunting with a rifle and just the way the property's laid out. But uh, a lot of people have been enjoying those episodes as well. Um, you know, basically it's a hunting-driven show. So... <laughs> There's, there's not much of us eating in the house or brushing our teeth or at the gas station or that type of thing. It's, it's pretty no B-roll. We don't like B-roll. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of B-roll. There, you know, there's nice aerials and time lapses and good production elements and all of that. But yeah, there's not a lot of wasted time because we've got the hunting footage to, to fill up the time. So that's that's we're getting good feedback about it. I think that's what people want to see and maybe a little bit of an element that's been missing on outdoor TV. So. We're hoping we're filling in that gap. That's awesome. Uh, I've been enjoying actually getting to uh, listen to you call elk, and um, I've been fortunate. You know, we were partners in the guide business for years, and we spent a lot of time in the field together calling elk, and I feel like getting to watch, um, you know, the TV show, I get to hear you calling, uh, which is something I miss, and um, I've, I've enjoyed, and I'm enjoying watching it on TV. Um, you know, one thing I notice is uh, you're bugling a lot more than what I used to remember you. Um, talk a little bit about uh, your use of the bugle and your, I don't want to say transformation, but, you know, you are the best cow elk, you know, both external and diaphragm caller I've ever heard, um, but you're a heck of a bugler as well. Um, and I noticed you bugling quite a bit more. Talk a little bit about that, what you've learned and what created that and, you know, what you're seeing, the response and what have you. Yeah, Jay, it just kind of honestly happened by accident. It wasn't intentional at all. It just seemed to be that was the kind of scenarios that I was running up against. I was running up against bulls with cows, and as we know, it's very hard to jerk them loose from their cows when they've got, you know, the supposed bird in hand, they don't want to go to the one in the bush, so to speak. So <laughs> I, I've just found over and over, especially with herd bulls, that they are so hard to pull away from the cows. But the last couple of years, I've just found myself in scenarios with them where I, I like to get close to elk regardless of how I'm going to call to them. And I found that when I get super close to them, and even so close that I bump their cows a little bit, that just the natural thing to do at that point is to is to is to bugle at that bull and let him think that you know that a bull has come in and gotten amongst his cows and is threatening to take his herd and you know i found that nine times out of ten it's all about distance it's it's distance and 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 and, and the type of terrain you're in but if, if you have that close close quarters with him if you're right in his kitchen he doesn't really have the opportunity to round up his cows and leave you. He's got to deal with you. And so I'm finding out that, you know, when you, you bugle at him, and, I, and when I bugle at him, I bugle like I mean it. I don't bugle as if I'm a little juvenile bull um, because I found that, that that herd bull or even the cows don't take it real serious. But it seems like if you bugle like you mean it, like I'm here to take your cows and I'm going to knock your teeth out, <laughs> but they tend to react to that and come right over angry. So let's, I, I want to dive into this just a little bit more. Um, so your work, kind of work through a scenario with me. You're working into a group of elk. You get pretty close. It's a bull that's, you know, mature bull, and he's got cows. And, and even if you don't bump the cows, are you cow calling or have you gone in silent um, from a listener, I want to make sure they get the value out of this. So, like, in the, in the perfect scenario, are you slipping in as silent as you can, 
Then you get in close and say the bull's on the other side of the, you know, of the other side of the herd. At that point, will you start out with the bugle and will you bugle like you mean it? Um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a good question, Jay. I typically will call my way in a little bit. I don't call a lot, and it's mainly just to keep tabs on the bull and kind of know where he where he's at. But a lot of times, though, I found that bulls with cows, when you do that, if you're trying to call your way in a little bit, they'll go silent on you. Even whether you're bugling or cow calling, a lot of times they'll go silent on you. So in that instance, you're kind of almost just guessing from where you last heard him as far as, far as how far away he is. And what I've been doing, too, the last couple of years is I've really found the value of a, of a decoy. And I've been using that Montana a uh, cow elk decoy, I think they call it the Eichler elk um, for Fred Eichler. But I, I have found that if, if I accidentally bump cows and I have that decoy out, they just lightly bump off, but they see that decoy and they don't booger bad at all. There's just a little, a little bit of a bump. And then if, if that happens, I will bugle in that instance right away. Um, I, I still let, 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 let me let me dive let me dive in something right here that I think is important. Um, sorry to interrupt, but so you're actually you are carrying this Montana decoy yourself usually, um, and usually you'll have a hunter and sometimes a cameraman. And so, will you be carrying the decoy? And so, as you're walking in or sneaking in, is the decoy? out in front of you like so if elk look they see it or do you hold it out of sight until you get visual on the elk yeah jay i i typically when i feel like i'm getting in a heated situation i've gotten more and more to where i will get it out and literally be holding it out in front kind of shielding especially because of the fact like you just mentioned there's three of us there instead of just one person so it, it's just amazing how they will just kind of lock in on that and just disregard everything. Matter of fact, I've had them look at, glance at the decoy, and then they just go right back to feeding. They don't even pay it any attention. They don't pay you any attention either. Um, I realize as, a, as someone who's a single hunter and, and hunting with a bow, that could be a little bit of a circus act, but I do know that there are some decoys that, that can mount to a bow that you can literally shoot right through. Um, I haven't gotten my hands on one of those, but I think those could be very valuable if running, you know, a Montana decoy with your hand would be a little too much to deal with. Um, but, yeah, I just found it's just ridiculous what you can get away with with those decoys. Now, the wind is still the biggest thing. If they wind you, it doesn't matter if that decoy is there or not. But as far as visual, gotcha. you, it, finding more and more visually, you can fool their eyes because it's been said that elk have the acuity of about 60 or 2060 when you compare it to okay. human vision. Yep. Okay, so as you're walking in, you're kind of holding it out in front of you, and, and in other words, like if a cow is feeding and she looks up, do you just kind of hold it steady or you, you kind of wave it around, or as you're walking, do you kind of just, just kind of keep it at, you know, like I'm curious, I, I'm getting a visual of this, and I've seen it some on the TV show. I'm just trying to get the full scoop of exactly how you're using that. Yeah, I don't, not that it wouldn't work. I haven't really tried it, but I, I don't really wiggle it around or intentionally move it around. I just kind of think of, of an elk just kind of smoothly walking in, you know, just nonchalant, not, not being an aggressor or anything like that. So I just pretty well just try to walk real smooth with it and just hold it, hold it out there in front, just nice, nice and easy and smooth. Okay, and then are you from time to time just, blowing, you know, just soft cow calling, just kind of, you know, I'm just walking into the herd, don't mind me type of thing? I uh, haven't really done that either, just pretty much using okay. the decoy. Matter of fact, okay. I, think it, I think it's the next episode that's coming up, Jay, on elk camp, literally walked up on a herd of a couple hundred elk in the wide open on the edge of a canyon, and we were literally on the edge out in the open. And the footage won't do it justice just because you, it has to be cut down somewhat for TV. But literally, there's probably five minutes of us walking up on this herd of 200 elk, I mean wild free-ranging elk, and just literally walking to within, say, 175 yards and having our way and getting sat down in position to shoot and killing a bull. It's, 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 wow. it's ridiculous. <laughs> 
That's, a, that's awesome. That's great stuff. Um, okay, Steve, um, I want to dive into a little bit of kind of your origin. I kind of want to shift gears here. We'll get back to tactics and some of that stuff, but um, I, I want to kind of get back to a, the story of you starting hunting, you know, with your dad, with your grandpa, or however it started. Um, and then kind of when you started really thinking that elk was something that you really enjoyed and talk a little bit about that as well as your upbringing. I know you played uh, uh, college baseball. You were a heck of a pitcher and, and athletics were a big part of. Talk a little bit about kind of growing up, where you grew up and how, you know, you transitioned into really enjoying hunting and getting your start in, in guiding and all of that stuff. Yeah, you bet, Jay. I was real fortunate because I was raised, you know, out in the country on the dirt road and in rural Colorado. And so with my dad and granddad being hunters, it was just kind of a natural thing. So, you know, from a very young age, I was going out with dad, especially on his mule deer hunts. And I can still remember carrying a little recurve bow and <laughs> thinking that I was going to shoot a big mule deer buck when I was like, you know, six or seven years old. And then, uh, I don't know, when I was seven or eight, I got a BB gun, and the next year they gave me pellets for it. It was one of those Crossman, you know, pump-up air gun things, and <laughs> I killed anything that I could with a pulse with that thing. I, I'd like to say that I've <laughs> mellowed out a little bit. I don't really get off on killing birds and things anymore, but, um, <laughs> you know, and then it progressed to a shotgun, and uh, back when I was young, you had to be 14 to hunt big game, so I still remember for my 14th birthday, I got a Ruger M77-270, and um, I had been going to the mountains um, in the years prior with my dad and granddad and, and hunting elk up there, and I can still remember uh, shooting my first elk that year when I was 14 years old. Um, it was a spike back when they were legal, and I'll never forget how it was to hear this herd of elk which there was probably only six or eight of them but it sounded like literally like thunder coming down the mountain like a herd of buffalo <laughs> they ran up didn't know we were there me and my brother brett and i can still remember him you know yelling at me shoot him shoot him shoot him you know i was like well, that's what i'm gonna do if you be quiet <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> ended up taking a spike and that kind of gave me the bug you know i went through a stage where i really liked mule deer um, but what really got me hooked, Jay, was um, I think it was was back in the early 90s. You know, I had been um, following Wayne Carlton and Will Primos, and, you know, they, they kind of really gave me the calling bug. And um, I remember you gave me that first palate plate mouth read um, that really transitioned into better calling, I will say. <laughs> and the first time I... Quick I question it, about... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, the, fir the first time I called in a, a bull with a pallet plate mouth read and shot it with my bow, I, it was the first time I went out, that first time I tried it, and I actually thought to myself, wow, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> I found out that it wasn't that easy every single time, as, as many of the listeners, you know, can relate to, um, but it was just pretty incredible how basically, you know, I went out in the dark crossed a river that was about thigh high. I don't know if I would do that anymore in the pitch black dark, being a little older and wiser, but started hiking up the mountain, you know, got up there maybe three quarters off the river and blew a couple of cow calls with that pallet plate. <laughs> a bull immediately answers me on up, on up the hill. So I walk up toward him, maybe another 150 yards, blow some more cow calls down behind me. And next thing I know here, he's coming down the hill bugling and you know, comes bugling into 30 yards, and I shoot him. It was just too easy that first time. So, um, yeah, you know, that's what... You know, one question I have, Steve, uh, uh, real fast about that is um, you, you mentioned the pallet plate, and before that, um, talk a little bit about the diaphragms that you were using and what difference you felt the pallet plate made, made immediately and why all of a sudden it, you gained a lot more confidence in your calling from just switching the call. Yeah, Jay, I was using, um, you know, anything from Lowman reads to, to the old, um, you know, original Carlton reads, um, Larry D. Jones reads, um, you know, nothing wrong with those reads. But for whatever reason, that palette plate 
being uh, kind of on a narrower frame to where there wasn't as much latex width. And I think also the fact of the pallet plate, you know, Rocky Jacobson, who builds my calls now with Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls, he came up with that concept. He, he patented the pallet plate, and it just was a game changer as far as mouth reads go, for me especially. Because, yeah, when I first met you in 95, Jay, and you gave me that, that pallet plate call, I mean, honestly, the minute I put it in my mouth and, and blew it versus the other reads I had been using, there was a dramatic difference. So it, it definitely does make a difference. Call design does make a difference um, for your listeners out there, and I would just encourage them to experiment around some and find what works for them. But I would say, you know, going with a pallet plate style call, as far as mouth reads go, is definitely going to get them off to a big head start for sure. Don't you think a lot of it is kind of the stabilization of the call, number one, and don't you think as well, um, it almost, when you put it in, it almost sits in the same exact spot uh, every time, so there becomes a consistency level where um, some of the regular, you know, what I would call old school diaphragms, maybe the, the stabilization is not as good and it's not sitting in the exact same spot inside your mouth up against, you know, up up in your palate at the same spot. Talk a little bit about that, uh, creating consistency. Because I remember, I remember I gave you that call, and I mean it was a used call. Like it wasn't like here here's a new one out of the package. Like I had one, and I'm like I think we washed it off, and I'm like here, and you immediately put it in, and it was like, but I could just see it in your eyes. Like this is awesome. Like talk about um, why you think that that call, and you know the calls that you design now. You know, talk a little bit about that, that stabilization and that consistency that now you can have with those calls. Yeah, it did, right away, the thing I noticed, Jay, when you gave me that call is that it just blew easy. It broke easy, so to speak. You didn't have to put so much air pressure and tongue pressure into it, and I think that's the key for any good call, um, whether it's a diaphragm or an open read call, it is that it breaks easy and blows easy without a lot of effort. And so that's what I noticed right away. And I agree. I think it's the fact that that pallet plate just positions the call in a consistent, comfortable spot in the top of your mouth. And so it's you, you start out with that consistency. And then when you just put your tongue on that latex and just introduce just a little bit of air from your stomach, you get sound out of the call. And you get that consistency because that call is not swimming around in your mouth, so to speak. So I just think there's so many advantages to that, and then the quality of sound you get out of it is just the icing on the cake. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, let's get back to, so the first elk you call in with the pallet plate, you think it's easy. Um, you know, talk a little bit about, okay, so now you've killed a bull with your bow, now you're totally pumped. Um, with that, around that same time frame, I believe, you know, you're, you're in, um, you know, high school athletics. You're, you know, you're you're blossoming as a pitcher. Uh, you, you know, you're playing college baseball. Talk about some of that part of your life as well, and you know what athletics meant to you as a kid growing up, and 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 maybe how it's kind of shaped some of the things that you do today, and in, in you know your discipline and your competitiveness and what have you. Yeah, I think sports is a great thing for kids. It was a great thing for me. I think it creates focus in you and a goal, and goal makes, makes you a goal-oriented person. I learned to push myself past my natural comfort level, especially um, the track and cross country that I ran. <laughs> so now when I think I'm breathing hard or hurting hiking up a hillside, I always think back to you know cross country and, and thinking about that and think, well, gosh, if I could do that, I, I need to man up and push through this. Um, but, yeah, I really enjoyed sports. I liked basketball. Um, you know, I wasn't 6'8 uh, with a 40-inch vertical, so I wasn't able to move on to college with that. But uh, to be honest, you know, I, I, was a, I was a good high school pitcher. I wouldn't say that I was phenomenal, but, um, you know, good enough that um, I, I was able to attend Yavapai College in Prescott, Arizona. And um, I actually just pitched there one year um, because after that I – decided that I wasn't going to be a professional baseball player either because I didn't have a 95-mile-an-hour fastball. Because um, there was a guy named Kurt Schilling that threw it like 102 miles an hour or something at your same college? 
Yeah, that's kind of my claim to fame is that <laughs> Kurt Schilling was there and pitched on the same squad um, with me. And, yeah, he was our standout pitcher. I believe he threw like 87, 88 tops back then. And then uh, okay. when he got into the pros, he just – he really matured and developed, you know, he, 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 he turned into more, uh, not, I shouldn't say more of a man, but he just matured a little more and filled out a little more. And so by the prime of his career, he was throwing like 98, um, yeah. you know, and a, definitely a Hall of Fame contender um, and, a, and a cool guy. I, he was a guy on the team who, who I liked, um, you know, seemed to have his head on straight, and I think that contributed to him having a good career. So, um that that was a you know a fun part of my life, but but then again I had to come to the realization like I was telling you you know when you throw in the low to mid eighties you just don't have much of a future in the in the pros even if you have a great slider like I had. <laughs> you know, I think that's a huge point that you're making, and we've talked about this before off the podcast and stuff. You know, you're obviously a dad, uh, a father. Um, your kids played athletics and as well and. You know, so you you not only played you know high school, college athletics. You know, you've been a dad of, of kids that have played high school and college athletics, um, and you see it all the time where the parents one are living, you know, through the kids. You know, um, they put so much pressure on the kids. Talk a little bit about your perspective of athletics. You know, raising kids you know, proper perspectives and, and what have you. That's very important, Jay. I really do feel like sports can get to be too much of the focus. And I see that more and more these days where for kids to be competitive, it's like they have to start at four years old and, and play the sport year round. And I almost think that that can get a little bit unhealthy. I don't know that there's an easy answer for that because I understand that if other kids are doing that, that your kid can, can fall behind. But we also have to keep it in perspective that it's about the kids and not about us as parents. And I think it's very easy to lose sight of that as a parent and just push your kids too hard to the point where they burn out. And, you know, literally, you could have someone who's got all kinds of natural talent. And if you push it too hard and make it too much of a priority in their life, just like with elk hunting, <laughs> like we were saying, if it was year-round, it could become more of a grind than fun. And I've actually seen it in kids to where they get to be college age and they're burned out on it and they just don't want to play anymore. They're done with it. So I think there's a real fine balance and, and a parent, as a parent, we just need to be real sensitive to that and just make sure we, we keep it fun. And if we see that maybe our kid is getting a little burned out, you know, it might be time for a break because they can have all the natural talent in the world, but if they don't have that sincere desire and drive to do it, then the spark is gone and it just doesn't work anymore. For sure. Steve, was baseball, let's talk about like when you were in high school, was baseball, first question is, was baseball your best sport, number one? And number two, do you feel like, um, answer that question first was baseball your number one sport or were you actually better at one of the other sports I would say baseball was yes um, you know in high school I was blessed to be you know a good hitter um, yeah I mean I, I, I could hit for average and I had home run power too and then uh, I was used a lot in pitching um, I played shortstop and pitcher my junior year and then my senior year the coach moved me to first base and pitcher because he saw that after I pitched and I was playing shortstop and throwing across the infield all the time, that was really hard on my arm. And I'm one of those guys who's not naturally limber. And so I had a lot of arm issues. And so I wasn't the guy that could, you know, throw every day. That's what amazed me when I went to college there at Yavapai is how many of those guys on the pitching staff could just seemingly throw every day and it didn't bother them. Uh, you know, me, I would be in my room crying if I, <laughs> tried to throw hard yeah. two days in a row. So that just didn't work for me. Um, you know, one thing that I was just a little bit disappointed in is when I went to college, I really had designs on hitting and being able, being able to hit some. But from day one, um, you know, they just viewed me as a pitcher. And so uh, there, the pitchers, that's all they did. We never picked up a bat. You had a DH in the lineup, a designated hitter. And so, um, yeah, I never swung a bat at all there. 
and uh, that's what I really loved in high school was to was to get up there and you know be, be especially sitting on that fastball when you're ahead in the count and I always tell people if you if you hit ahead in the count that's when you're going to be a good hitter if you're selective right. and, and look for that fastball and hit it in your zone and then I tell people who are pitchers you want to pitch ahead in the count if you're ahead in the count as a pitcher you can pretty much throw and do whatever you want because you're in command of the situation at that point. Do you feel like, I mean, looking back, if you had to do it over again, I mean, obviously, uh, Yavapai was attracted to you because of your pitching. Do you feel like, I mean, do you feel like if you had to do it over again that you would have put more focus on, like, no, I actually want to play some, you know, somewhere else in the field, but I want to be a hitter? I mean, do you regret that, or do you look at that that you would do that differently if you had to do it over again? Yeah, you know, maybe a little bit, Jay. I would have probably been a little more assertive, but you know how it is when you're an 18 or 19-year-old. Um, you're just not super assertive at that point in your life, which I think is good. I mean, I had a lot of respect for my coaches and, you know, um, viewed their opinions above mine and, you know, just wanted to be a team player and, and play where they would have me to play. Um, so I can still remember my last time uh, pitching. I actually came in in relief, and I'm like the gosh, Jay, it seems like the bases were loaded, and uh, they brought me in in relief, and <laughs> I struck one. The coach, oh, the coach asked me in the bullpen. He said, "Is your slider working?" I think he called it your fly, my flying saucer at the time, <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, <laughs> it's working. It's working good." He said, "Good because you're going to be throwing it a lot." And so, <laughs> I was fortunate to be able to strike the first hitter out, and then the second hitter up uh, hit into a double play, hit to our a grounder to our third baseman, and he turned to double play, so it got us out of the inning, and we won the game. And that was that was the last time I pitched. So I guess it ended on a good yeah. note. Yeah. Wow, the flying saucer. Was that a pitch that, like, did your dad teach you that, or how, how did you how did you fall onto that? Yeah, originally he did, definitely. Um, and I would say it wasn't really a pure slider or it wasn't a curve. It was more of a, a slurve, if you will. It was kind of a combination of both. So it had a lot of movement as a right-hander. It broke hard to the left, but then it also dropped quite a bit as well. So, it, you know, when you can have a pitch that, that moves on two planes, it's, it, it's tougher to hit. Um, and, again, I wasn't overpowering. It was just the movement on the ball that uh, made it made it work. But, okay, but yeah, I got out this question. I Go got to ask this question. Have you since, have you since you last pitched, like, you know, playing with the girls or whatever, you know, teaching them, you know, playing with the girls in softball or whatever, have you ever, like, watched this and, you know, fired back and tried to do it, and how did it go? <laughs> Actually, um, we have some pretty good friends in the Phoenix area, and they have a little phenom who's a baseball player. Um, I'll say his name, Tommy Bonetto, if he's listening. But uh, anyway, um, they came out and spent some time with us for a week or so, and, you know, I knew he was a good baseball player, so I went out in the yard with him and was throwing the ball and, you know, <laughs> firing up the slurve at him, but I quickly found that that little guy has a live arm, man. I, I, I quickly kind of backed down and saw that, that this guy, you know, was, was, was going to yeah. overpower. So um, anyway, yeah, it's been a long time, but um, it's still a lot of fun for sure. Could you still get the ball to do what it was doing when you were throwing, you know, throwing in college? I mean, what is, was it still no. moving? Not not as much. No, I didn't have the life and the, and the sharp break that it used to have, you know. Yeah, and my vertical is now a credit card, so I, I don't have <laughs> that I have in high school either. So <laughs> i got to ask you, how long did you, how long did you have to ice your arm? Yeah. How long did you have to ice your arm after going out and throwing with the kids? <laughs> Yeah, no kidding, huh? That was a, <laughs> an Advil moment for sure and some ice. <laughs> yeah, I would not, be, uh, would not be up pitching batting practice to a team. That's for sure right now. No, no. <laughs> uh, man. Um, Steve, uh, uh, another part of um, – I like talking about this stuff because it just, you know, people get to know you and what have you, and I know some of this stuff, so it's fun asking you about it. But um, another thing is uh, your dad is – 
has been a farmer for a long, long time, and uh, you have a whole aspect uh, in your background uh, in in your area of expertise is farming. Talk a little bit about uh, the dry ground farming and and some of the stuff that you've been involved with uh, throughout your whole life. Right. Yeah, I grew up on a farm and, and then seeing my dad farm and then helping my dad farm, you know, as a little kid, that's the first thing you want to do as a, as a young boy is be able to drive dad's tractor and help him out. And I could still remember, you know, checking to see if my feet would reach the pedals and all of that to be able to drive. And, um, yeah, I mean, I learned from the best for sure. My dad is a phenomenal dry land farmer. He just knows ground condition and timing and just you know what to do when to do it um it's just really an art um i think there's a misconception that it would be easy and not a lot of intelligence would go into farming but it, but successful farmers i think are very intelligent about their craft and um you know that's what i learned from my dad and it, it just i think was a really good genuine lifestyle to grow up into um, you know, I don't, not only that, but also, you know, being raised in a Christian home was a real blessing. Um, you know, having a mom and dad who would take me to church and just teach me the value of that and the value of working hard and the value of a dollar. Um, I think it's all paid off. I'd, I'd like to think so awesome. anyway. Hopefully I'm passing that on to my daughters as well, but that hard work and, and just living with uh, character does pay off. That's awesome, buddy. Um, the type of farming that you guys do and that you've done pretty much your whole life is is pinto beans, correct? And and as well as um, hay, hay farmers. Yeah, for the most part, pinto beans. Um, we kind of had to phase alfalfa out quite a few years ago, or, or my dad did because of the fact that this uh, climate has just become persistently droughty in the southwest. So if you don't have water to put on it, alfalfa just requires really deep moisture. And if you don't get those, those big winters consistently, um, it just doesn't work because you have to run pretty good expensive equipment in order, in order to do hay right. Because when it's ready, it needs to be cut and baled. There's no messing around. You can't be having breakdowns all the time running real old equipment. So... Um, it's it's more become for my dad pinto beans and, and wheat in recent years. Talk a little bit about pinto beans. Obviously, I, I don't know anything about them. Maybe a, a few facts that maybe people don't know about pinto beans. Maybe you know, talk a little bit about that area that you guys live in. You know, is it you know how does it fall within the pinto bean you know capital of the world, so to speak, or you know. <laughs> You know, bring out some facts there that maybe people don't know. You are correct, Jay. Um, you know, southwest Colorado, the Dove Creek area, is actually known as the pinto bean capital of the world. Um, so pinto beans are, you know, roughly a 90 to 100-day crop, meaning from planting to harvest time, just depending on the variety that you're planting. Um, so Typically, a, a pinto bean farmer would be planting them very, very last part of May or early June and expecting a harvest there in early September. Um, it, pinto beans are a very resilient plant and a very good dry land crop because they, they're just real drought tolerant. I mean, they will basically sit there and try and hang on all summer long waiting for those, you know, what typically are mid-July to early August monsoons. And if they get just some help, you know, if you get an inch of rain there in July and then maybe another follow-up one in August, you can make a pretty good crop. Um, you know, the challenge is always, are those monsoons going to hit? Um, as you know, same way with elk hunting, they can be kind of spotty, and if they miss you, it's the difference between having a bumper crop and then just having a real average crop. So it's a, you know, tough and humbling way to make a living for sure. Speaking of making a living, um, what have the pinto bean prices done, you know, over the years since, you know, farming as a kid with your dad and, and to now, is, you know, the prices always remain pretty steady or is it one of those crops that fluctuates a lot? So, in other words, you could have an incredible crop and then all of a sudden the price is down or is it one of those that, you know, a relatively, um, you know, flat or, you know, you can pretty much predict the, the pricing that you're going to get? 
Yeah, Jay, you're correct. It can definitely fluctuate based on, you know, availability. If there's a lot of pinto beans raised in the Dakotas and other places and there's a bumper crop everywhere, it always seems like when you have a bumper crop <laughs> that, the, that the lower price always seems to level things out. And then when you have a really poor crop, the price can go up because there's not a lot of uh, the availability for them. But then you don't have a lot of crop to sell. So um, to be honest with you, that's what kind of caused me really to seek to get into the, the hunting side of things because that was a passion that I had already. And I always say, you know, I got into it a little bit out of necessity in the beginning. Um, of course, I absolutely love it. Um, but I just saw that the farming was such a roller coaster ride and a tough way to count on paying your bills. So I, I just um, had kind of an entrepreneurial mind. I started looking for other ways to step outside of that and, and, and make more of a consistent living, so to speak. Um, but for I sure. absolutely respect guys like my dad who have done it for decades and made it work for, you know, their entire adult life. It's a pretty amazing thing when you look at men like that. Yeah. For sure. And, Steve, you've started uh, Zero Hunt Fees. Um, talk a little bit about that uh, from, you know, you talk about your transition into guiding and loving elk hunting and, and being a farmer and you still farm, uh, but knowing that, you know, you felt like you wanted to have an extra, you know, business and another source of income and then you start, you know, uh, chapel guide service and, and you start the extreme bulls videos, uh, you know, you, you uh, make uh, elk calls, both external and, and uh, mouth reads. Uh, you know, you put out DVDs, you have a TV show, and then you start Zero Hunt Fees. Talk a little bit about that program for those listeners out there that don't know. <laughs> yeah, back to what we were talking about in the very beginning, about going five different directions at one time. <laughs> so, but it's a blessing. I'm, I'm glad to have these opportunities, and, you know, it's a blessing from God. I give him all the credit for it. Um, you know, the big thing about Zero Hunt Fees that made – that program makes sense is when the Arizona Game and Fish changed the draw in 2016. And, the, you know, their intention with the draw, which I think is great, is that it has an element of fairness because of the bonus point round and then an element of randomness in the random part of the draw. So it's a hybrid draw, and they recognize that on the non-resident side of things that it has just become a completely bonus point-driven draw. And to their credit, I know it hurt some people who had high points, but they recognized that if they didn't do something about it, that it was just going to get worse and worse as far as being a bonus point runaway for non-residents. They corrected that and made it to where half of the non-resident tags are issued in the bonus point round, but they save half of the non-resident tags, and they're in the random draw where they can be drawn. Uh, matter of fact, the very gentleman who I hunted with in Unit 9 in 2016 and was on elk camp, um, on one of the episodes, he drew Unit 1 archery this year. So two years later, he drew in the random draw. So with that in mind, it made that concept of the, of the zero hunt fees plan totally make sense to where, you know, you could offer a program like we're doing for $349 a year to non-residents, and they pay that yearly amount, and when they draw a tag, their guided hunt is completely covered. It's amazing, Jay, how many people I talk to on the phone, and they're like, really? So really, Steve, what's the catch? And I tell them, really, there is no catch. If there is a catch, it's that you have to draw a tag. You're not guaranteed to draw the tag, but you have the opportunity every year to draw a tag. So really, it's similar. It's a really, you could think of it as hunting insurance because you're, you're paying that yearly membership fee to hedge against the fact that if you draw a tag, and you want to go on a guided hunt, and you don't want to pay six or seven thousand dollars for a guided hunt, that your membership will float that fee for you, and you have no more due on your hunt. When guys get that, it's like a light bulb comes on, <laughs> and you know they they really buy into it. And I think it's a great concept because it really does make a guided hunt affordable to really anyone who has the desire to do it. Because I know how intimidating it can be to go out of state and go to a unit that you've never been to. Even if you're a seasoned elk hunter, like Jay, you and I went on my Utah elk hunt back in 2007. 
and you know thankfully for through our network of friends we had quite a bit of good information to go on and i know people can you know get on forums and stuff nowadays and get quite a bit of information but it's still in my opinion until you have boots on the ground in the unit it's very intimidating to show up and just not really know if you're in the right spot or you know how to call or what we call the blow and all of that and um, this program really eliminates all of those issues for people because uh, their hunt is paid for they're, they're, they're with a guide um, who knows the unit it's just really simplifies and, and allows people to, um, to be able to come to Arizona and have a great hunt we actually had uh, two first year members draw this year and three second year members drew and they're super excited about their upcoming hunts Okay, so let, I got a few questions about this. Um, so right now, if someone's listening to this podcast and they wanted to sign up for your Zero Hunt Fees program, they could, going into the next draw, whether, you know, whether they have bonus points or no bonus points, you know, wherever they're at, you would talk to them and you know, ask them about what type of hunt they're looking for and what have you, but they could sign up for your program. They could pay $350.00. They could go into the Arizona draw, this coming upcoming draw, and draw a hunt for, you know, basically they have $350 invested, and they could get a hunt value of, you know, six or 7000 you know, 4500 to 7000 depending on, you know, the going rate of, of guided hunt prices. And you had, you said, two people on the first year and, and, and uh, or this year draw and that didn't have any bonus points or, or first-time members. And then uh, I think you said two or three people that are second-year members? Yeah, that's correct. So the first-year members, you're exactly right. They have a $349 elk hunt coming their way. Obviously, it's going to be a more valuable elk hunt than that. It's going to be a high-quality elk hunt, but that's all they're paying for it. So it's a phenomenal thing. And also, Jay, I'm glad you brought that up because I realize that we're past the point of the 2018 draw. So someone could not hunt Arizona this fall if they're just hearing about this program. So what I'm doing to encourage people to look at the program and to sign up right now is if they sign up right now, um, you know, during this off season, their membership applies to 2019. So if they join Zero Hunt Fees now, they wouldn't have another membership payment until 2020. So it covers their 2019 elk season and elk draw. And then also I'm upgrading them to a seven-year membership level. So in other words, on this first year, it's, it's as if they had been in the program for seven years. And members earn more guided hunting days as they're in the program for longer. So here's the cool thing. <laughs> as a seven-year member, which they're upgraded to, they would have immediately a 10-day fully outfitted archery hunt coming their way on the very first year or if they're a firearms hunter, they would have a full seven-day fully outfitted hunt coming their way. So it gives them huge incentive to sign up here in this off-season. Really, there's no downside to signing up now. Wow, that's, that's really cool. Now, does this just apply to Arizona elk, or do you do deer or any other species in Arizona as well? Right now, Jay, I'm just doing it for elk. And it's basically because... That's what we really focus on. That's what we're known for. I mean, I do have some very talented guides who, you know, are great coos deer hunters or, you know, great antelope hunters. Uh, you know, they know the strip or the kaibab. Um, but it's just we just get all of our demand for elk hunts, and so it makes the most sense to offer it for that. So that's what we're specializing in right now. Good stuff. Um, how do people, if they want to know more about it, how do they find out more about your Zero Hunt Peace program? Thanks, Jay. It's, um, they could just log on to zerohuntfees.com, and it's got three pages just loaded with information on the program. I think if someone reads through those pages, they will have a really solid understanding of the program, and then they can reach out to me either by phone or by by email or a form that's actually on the website, and I can respond to them, and we can start the process going. Very, very easy. Awesome, awesome. Well, 
uh, congrats to the guys that uh, have drawn with you this year and, and the first time and, and then the second timers. That's pretty pretty dang cool. I'm sure they're stoked. Uh, Steve, let's take another quick break here, and then I want to dive into some of these questions from listeners and uh, Instagram followers. Okay, Steve, um, let's dive into, uh, I put out on Instagram questions with Steve Chapel of Elk Camp TV, and I got a question here from KW Scott on Instagram says, what is the best tactic to use to call in a bull that has cows? Yes, What's Jay, answer, we talked Steve? about that a little, a little earlier, and, you know, really just by, like I was saying, the last couple of years, I like to think that I don't go to the woods with a locked-in approach, although, the, you know, there's some hard and fast rules to elk calling. You know, number one, the wind, you have to obey that. Number two, getting as close as you can. Number three, elk have very good depth perception, so you don't want them to see your calling location. Those are kind of the hard and fast rules of calling. But as far as sounds that I use, I have gotten less, locked in to do, to just doing certain things and trying to do it force my way on them so to speak and um like the listener stated he's talking about a bull with cows and i've just found more and more that if you get in into their kitchen and i'm talking you usually have to be almost amongst their cows to where they feel like when you introduce yourself to that bull whether it be a cow call or a bugle he knows that you're basically inside of his herd or you're part of his herd. And I've just found in the last couple of years that, you know, blowing a bugle like you mean it just really gets results. Um, you know, most times what I'm using, Jay, is what people refer to as a lip ball bugle or a display bugle where you're, you know, sputtering your lips into the call and it just makes that raspy. It just has an aggressive big bull sound. Um, that that to me is a sound that bulls make when they're confident and, and dominant, and it just really seems to get bulls to come over and, and march right in and take a look at you when you do that. Steve, let me ask you a question. We've all heard the guys that, honestly, they pick up the bugle three days before, they've never blown it, and they think, oh, I'm going to throw an elk bugle out there. Do you think that there's times when guys that are not, that do not sound good at all and sound very human-like, um, you know, so it has a very human element sound to it, would you, what, what advice would you give to that person as well? I mean, do you, do you feel like if you if your buddy sounds horrible, is it okay to give him the advice like, buddy, that doesn't sound anything like an elk? So even though Steve's saying get in close and bugle at him, like, I'm sorry, but that's not going to work for you. Like, some people need to be realistic, and we've all heard those bugles out there that were like, that's a human. That, there's, that is a human. What is your advice to people that maybe aren't as good at bugling? <laughs> Do you still hold hold that you know get in there and bugle at them boys go for it <laughs> you, you have me smiling from ear to ear jay that, that's a great point um because i i agree with you it's it's got to sound elky and authentic so it's got to have the right tone quality the right volume the right emotion everything in there because if it just sounds um just really flat and 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 just wrong it just pitchy just not right um, it's going to set those elk on edge. And I found especially that cows can be more picky even than the bull. And if they hear something that's just way off, they'll just walk right toward the bull and just basically walk away and pull him away with them. Um, you know, if that's your buddy that's blowing it that way, um, <laughs> you have to be <laughs> a dude, little you bit. Suck. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I remember telling a buddy one time, I said, dude, you're ruining my mojo. He he was blowing a mouth read in the truck as we were going down the road on a hunt, you know, just over and over. And I literally said, dude, you're ruining my mojo. <laughs> but I said it in a joking, sweet sort of way, but I was, you know, underneath, I was kind of serious about it. Um, so in that instance, if you know, if everybody has real life and jobs and everything, and I realize people can't devote 300 days a year to practicing calling. Um so if you're able to get yourself in that scenario where you're kind of right in there tight with a herd bull, what I found a lot of times is, is if you just set up and sit there, 
a lot of times what will happen is the herd bull, he, he mingles around amongst his cows. He goes back and forth and checks, you know, on both sides, checks various cows out. A lot of times by being in there and saying absolutely nothing is the best thing to do and just letting that bull make a mistake. Uh, you know, and if you're very stealthy and you have the wind in your favor and don't move or get picked up on by a cow, um, th that's a lot of times the very best way to kill a giant bull for sure. I know some very accomplished hunters who, who really do it that way. I think, matter of fact, Randy Ulmer, who we both know, um, is more about stealth than about calling. And um, he, <laughs> we both, it's well documented, he's killed some absolute giants doing it that way. For sure. Uh, Steve, I don't know if you have an uh, elk bugle nearby, but, um, and I'm sure after talking for an hour, you're like, great, I got the bugle on, 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 on demand here. But, um, just from a, from a sound perspective, uh, or, or so that people can kind of hear that bugle that you're going to make that if you do sneak in, you talk about kind of a lip ball, you talk about, you know, it, it, it's an aggressive, sound can you give us an example or two of what you're talking about yeah i'll kind of blow it two different ways i'll just do a pure lip ball and then i'll also do what our friend joel turner refers to as a bull calling cows bugle and you'll see the difference the first one is just kind of a pure raspy lip ball and the second one starts out kind of with a high tone and then goes into that lip ball sound and that would be more of the bull calling cow's bugle, as Joel puts it. Um, so let me do both of those for you. Okay, did you hear the difference in those, Jay? Yeah, I did. So... Um, I remember Joel t talking on a podcast that I did with him about that bull calling uh, cow's bugle. So after after listening to what Joel has said, you you put a lot of stock in that. You know, Jay, I really do. I really think he's on to something there. Um, I almost try when I do that bugle. I should probably back away from saying when I do that bugle, I'm wanting to knock the bull's teeth out. Because like Joel talked about with you, and I heard that podcast, when you do that call, you're more talking to the bull's cows. And so when I do that call, I'm almost more trying more to be pretty to those cows, if that makes sense. Trying to make just a, a pretty, confident sound that says, hey, I'm, I'm a stud. I'm better than your herd bull. You need to come take a look at me. And it just causes just instant rage and jealousy in that herd bull. And they do. They feed, they feed off of jealousy. Uh, matter of fact, a bull that we killed on the muzzleloader hunt last year that was on the elk camp show, um, he was with cows, and I called in a young bull with cow calling, and he came over and left his cows because of jealousy. Um, and it wasn't even to a, um, you know, a bull calling cow's bugle or a display bugle. It was just purely to to cow calling, but again, back to that sound, um, I really do think that there is something to that, and that is a real call that means something to those elk, and uh, it, it, it puts out the proper message that you're trying to, that you're trying to put out there. So in other words, it's like you walk, it's like walk, you walking into a bar, and you don't, you're not talking to the guy that's got the couple of hot chicks over there, you're actually walking in and you're saying, hey, baby, I'm, I'm a stud myself. So you've got that real confident bugle. And is that the same principle of, like, you're not actually addressing the bull. You're addressing the girls and talking directly to them, which in turn, you know, hack him off so he immediately comes over. Yeah, absolutely. I don't like putting it in human terms because I'm definitely not a fighter kind of person. <laughs> so you would never see me walk into a bar and flirting with a guy's girlfriend, but I definitely don't mind flirting with a bull's cows. Um, because I can care less about that. But that's exactly it. Um, basically, you're almost ignoring the guy, acting as if he's not even there, and just flirting with, and talking in the best tone of voice that you can talk to, to his girl or those ladies there, and that's what it's all about. And you, you know, transfer that to the elk woods with that same mindset and learning to blow that call like that, and that's the same scenario that you're setting up out there in the elk woods. 
Good stuff. Uh, next question is from Cody Fulmer uh, on Instagram. Cow call or bugling, which is less technical, thus easier to learn for a beginner? Well, my answer to that is I think because cow, cow calling is a much shorter sound, but right. I think you should learn and be proficient at cow calling before you do bugling. Uh, and I actually think less technical to just make general cow sounds, I think, is less technical than bugling uh, and easier for a beginner. Steve, your thoughts? Yeah, Jay, I, even though I said neither, I was kind of joking about that. I, I totally agree <laughs> with you on that um, because bugling is a longer sound and it's a lot easier to just sound flat and phony on that. But even for a guy who's not able to learn to run a mouth read, learning to blow an open read call, in my opinion, everyone should be able to do that. Just spending a, just a little amount of time, and especially if you're listening to real elk sounds and just trying to you know, take the same cadence and the same tonal quality, if you can you know, get close to replicating that in the field, it doesn't have to be perfect like you were saying because it's a short sound. And I've even, you know, I've seen videos and I've seen on TV where people aren't necessarily the greatest callers in the world, but you get those bulls in the rut and their eyes are rolled back in their heads, so to speak, and, you know, especially the satellite bulls who are hungry to get with cows. And, you know, you're just able to just basically make those mews and chirps that cows and calves make. And you know, even just really just a standard mew, it, it's just extremely effective. And, and I would still say that really overall, that's, that's my go-to call and the way I lean when I go out in the woods. Uh, you know, I said I don't really force myself and my approach on them, but I would still say I lean more toward being a cow caller for sure. So uh, yeah. your listener focuses on that, on, on learning to cow call and just getting that down. I think he'll have more success than he can even imagine. Good stuff, um do you have an external or a mouth diaphragm and maybe give the listeners just some, um, you know, general cow sounds with each call? Yeah, I've got this uh, external read it. It's a matriarch right here, so I'll just blow some various cow calls on it so, so they can hear what I'm talking about. Hopefully it comes out decent. Yeah, and before, before you do that, Steve, I want to encourage the listeners to um, go to Steve's website, chapelguardservice.com. I think there's links there on the YouTube. And if not, go to just go to Google or go to YouTube and type in uh, Steve Chapel Elk Calling. Highly recommend watching Steve, watching the way his lips, you know, are placed on either the external or watch how he holds the call. Watch on the external how he exactly holds the call and how his Three, his ring finger, his pinky finger, and middle finger kind of stick up if he's doing like the okay sign. Um, look at yes, mm -hmm. kind of the pressure that Steve's putting on holding the call. That's on the external. And then on the other videos, he has videos that are, um, you can see his lip, kind of the pressure. You can see how he's holding his mouth. I mean, there's a lot of things I think by listening is huge but by seeing exactly how steve does it um i think uh, you know i've sent a lot of people to go check out steve's stuff and it's he's definitely one you know the best elk caller that i know and so you know whatever i'm doing if it's you know trying to learn how to throw a baseball or hit a hit a you know tennis ball or a golf ball i want to learn from the best and so and and i don't say that because steve's my friend i say that because I've heard a lot of people out call, and Steve is the best I've ever heard. And so I think the listeners can really pick up a lot if you Google those um, videos. So go ahead, Steve, and make some sounds there. Thanks for that, Jay. And no pressure now, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's going to read. Yeah, so, you know, I'm not doing anything real radical on it. I'm not blowing it loud or dragging it out a lot. It's just kind of just that normal short mew that the cows do is, is typically what I'm doing. 
Steve, do you feel like um, do you feel like the common elk hunter out there has watched videos and has been you know watching videos and uh, you know listening to elk and what have you as far as people how to call elk and you know there's this whole push of you know you know getting aggressive and getting loud and getting you know harsh um, obviously the sound coming through the phone is I feel like if people listen to the actual videos or watch them on YouTube they're going to get a better sound quality than than yeah. what we're hearing through the phone but do you feel like, in general, the, the 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 average elk hunter blows way too harsh, way too uh, you know drags it out, tries to get way too fancy? Yeah, I have noticed that, and I think it not not at the fault of hunters. It's just that they've seen people on videos doing that quite a bit, where, like you say, they just get really loud on the call. Um, they they really try to make it wavy and drag it out and all of that. And it's just not necessary, I, I found, um, because you don't really hear cows doing that a ton. Um, it's more just the normal, just communication, everything relaxed, and everything's okay, and yeah, I'm mama cow, I'm over here, and you know, everything's good. That, that seems to me to work way better just being just mellow and sexy, is the way I like to say it, um, versus being loudmouthed and harsh. Um, you know, the only exception I have to that is when I blow that excited estrusy sound, but that's in limited situations, and I don't really mix that into my normal calling um, as far as when I'm making cow sounds. So it's it's a, it's a, it's one or the other. I don't I don't mix the two, so to speak, if that makes sense. Yeah, let's hear some calls with your mouth call, some cow calls, and then, and then do a little bit of that excited um, cow calling that you're talking about. Okay, I'll see what I can do here. Okay, so that would just be the normal, you know, cow calling, just relaxed. I'll turn it up a little bit and get into more of that high-pitched, excited stuff and, you know, that kind of extra scream that I do so you, the listeners can hear the difference. So I'll kind of start with the normal cow calls and build into that. So yeah, that's th those other sounds. I wasn't nailing it perfect. I'm a little rusty on it right now. I need to get on it for the next three weeks here. But um, th those sounds, yeah, they're higher pitched. Um, they're louder. Um, I'm activating my vocal cords in there to get that kind of growly uh, cow sound out, out of it. Um, but again, I want to stress that it's really easy to... To, to, to make it rocket science when it's not. You don't need to make it hard. Um, you know, guys can really have a lot of success with just blowing that nice, normal cow mew. That, that's, what, that's where the, I should say that's the foundation of your calling. So get that down and then progress from there. Steve, would you say that the vocal cord vibrating and getting that, you know, excited, getting, you know, really getting into it, with that call in your arsenal when, when you know, the elk are really rutting and, you know, what I would say towards the end of the archery season in Arizona going into the early rifle season, as you transition more into using what you call the estra scream, you know, using your vocal cords, has that call been a game changer for you? It has, and Jay, I still... I'm not, it's not my first bag, trick in the bag, so to speak. I'm still hesitant about using it just because it's just very aggressive and it kind of flies in the face of my personality and the way I normally hunt. So it seems like when I use it, it's going to be 
you know, mid-morning when the elk have kind of shut down on their own and stopped bugling. And at that point, I feel like I'm kind of forcing myself on them. Um, whereas I think I probably could have had results with it using it at prime time if I had gone to it. And then the same way in the, the afternoon and evening, um, I found that I use it when nothing is happening and I feel like I have nothing to lose by doing it because I've tried cow calling, I've tried location bugles, I've tried various calls and just haven't got, gotten a response. Um, and a lot of times it takes someone with me, like my cousin Gary, who will just say, Steve, get that call out and start blowing it, and I want you to blow it every time your left foot hits the ground, like that, to me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and inevitably, it, it's amazing how often it works, how the woods can be completely quiet, elk just not really in the mood to talk, and you start trolling around, making that sound, just lighting it up. All of a sudden, it'll, it'll wake things up. They'll start bugling, and next thing you know, you have a, you have a train wreck right in front of you. <laughs> the bull bugling coming in. I'm curious, um, your elk in Colorado, you have the fortune of, you know, after the great bugling and cow calling season in Arizona, you get to go to Colorado, and it's almost like a second rut, um, and you get lots of activity. Um, how has that, you know, ester screen, using your vocal cords, that excited cow calling, how has that been received by the Colorado elk, and have you noticed any difference, or is it exactly the same response as the Arizona yeah, Jay, I've actually noticed a little bit less of a response to it just because we're hunting a big herd there. I hear that sound frequently out of these elk in that big herd. Um, gosh, matter of fact, the episode that's playing right now, um, well, it's not on right now, but the one that's airing on Sportsman Channel at this time with Ron Giles, I am literally trying to stop a bull for him to shoot at, and I'm making that exact sound, and the bull and cows are ignoring it. They're, they're just continuing walking away from us, not even paying attention to it. And I have to chuckle to make that bull turn and stop. And that literally makes him turn and bugle back. Uh, so I found that in Colorado overall, and I think mainly because we're hunting a big, big herd of elk that's all congregated together, and they're very vocal and very noisy. So you just almost kind of blend in unless you do something pretty dramatic. Um, I think guys would have better results if they were out hunting more typical scenarios where they were hunting, you know, singles and small groups of elk. So, you know, I don't Good want stuff, to yeah. broad swipe brush and say that it doesn't work in Colorado because I think the situation I'm in is very unique there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, next question is from Joey Ween, uh, and that's W-I-E-M on Instagram. He says, uh, walking slash calling early season Colorado OTC bow bow hunt looking for elk hunting elk cow call sequence so I think what he's looking for is you're out prospecting you're out looking and try, you know early season Colorado over the counter bow um, people want to know the calling sequence the one thing before before you probably demonstrate what your calling sequence is, I think one of the things I would like to add is, like, there's been so much talk about, you know, my calling sequence and here's my plan and this is my program and this is what I'm going to do and this is my strategy, this is my, you know, my tactic, my approach. Um, yeah. You almost have to back up and be like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be like an elk. You know, there really is, you know, in my opinion, there it really is no, like, cut and dry, like, this is exactly what I'm going to do every time. You had talked about it earlier, like, where you kind of have to have a whole bag of tricks and, like, you kind of have to just see what's going on. But I think for people that are newer at it, people that are, you know, just learning, it's, it's easier for them to feel like, okay, this is my this is my strategy or this is my sequence, this is my go-to, one thing I would encourage listeners is to not always have the same three-note call and that's all you do because elk will tend to kind of key in on like, you know, why is that guy over there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you hear other videos and people calling, they're like, this is my cow calling and Steve, you know, you've probably heard it where it's like, yeah, 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 yeah,
Yeah. Well, I've been out listening a lot, and I've been fortunate to be around an elk during, you know, 30 days of the rest for probably the last 22 years of just nonstop listening to elk. And I never hear elk that just go, <laughs> and just, like, have this whole sequence. Um, now, I think you can have a strategy or you can have some calls that you throw out there to get response, but don't get stuck in the rut of, like, you have to, you know, A, sound like a herd and just go crazy, you know, <laughs> and number two, like, you, you, you've got to mix it up. You, you never hear, well, I shouldn't say you never, but it's rare to hear an elk just do a three-note call and that's all they do. Like, they'd call one time, or they'll call for, you know, yeah, yeah, and then they're done. Like, you, you talk a little bit about that, Steve, and what's your answer to the, you know, out-prospecting your sequence that you're going to use? Yeah, and I'm assuming definitely by what he said that he's hunting elk that are silent at that point, that are typically, in other words, he's not going out there and there's bulls bugling on their own. So he's trying to prospect for a bugle. And I completely agree with what you said, that a hunter will will gain more and more hunter instinct, so to speak, where they get a feel for, you know, when they should call and how often. I, I would say if I had any rule about it, you know, definitely – Anytime you come over, say, a new ridge line or, you know, you break into some, you know, different terrain or whatever, or you feel like since the last time you called, if you're cow calling, that a bull probably couldn't hear you anymore. So, in other words, I'm not calling every time my left foot hits the ground, but de depending on the terrain and vegetation, I might be, say, calling every quarter of a mile, maybe every half a mile. Um, sometimes if it's if it's thicker, I might call a little more often, um, but, but a little more subtle. Um, and like you say, I'm not going to do any set sequence, and I'm not going to overpower them and, and try to sound like a herd, because that just seems like it's a little bit of an abrupt introduction, so to speak. So I'm more likely going to call, like, like you were talking about, Jay, you know, maybe one to three calls and leave it at that. And then, and then move along, and you just have to be so vigilant and pick up on anything because a lot of times in that early season, they're not going to respond by bugling and come running in bugling all of a sudden. They're, gonna, they're just going to come walking in, and you're going you're gonna to be on your feet moving toward them, and a lot of times, and don't feel bad if that happens to you, but it can happen to where you're moving toward them, they're moving toward you, and you don't know it, and you, and you bump them. So I would just say that's why it's, in my opinion, you can get away with some noise with elk, but I think it makes sense to try to be stealthy because that way you can hear better and you can hear that stick break or that antler hit a limb or something to get your attention and know that, that, that they're coming your way and then, you know, get set up and be ready for them. Um, but, yeah, that's the toughest part of early season hunting is that you're hunting a lot of times those silent elk and I have to be honest, um, when I'm hunting elk, I'm not extremely um, patient. I, I like to find the bull that's bugling and wants to play the game. Um, so I'm not much for sitting there for 20 or 30 minutes and do what I would call a silent calling um, setup type thing. That's just not really my style, although, although I know it works for some people. Um, but I would be more like your listener, kind of moving along, um, you know, calling a little bit as I feel guided to call and then uh, just listening for any sort of, of movement or response to me. And sometimes the bull, they may bugle, but it just may be very light and half-hearted as well. Steve, it, you know, talking about a specific sequence, um, when you're just prospecting, um, are, are you going to lean towards prospecting with your external call, or are you going to uh, lead towards kind of just prospecting uh, with your mouth call, and if so, can you tell us um, or, or demonstrate maybe just a, a little bit of a, a, a sequence that you would use uh, with, with, with your go-to call? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, without sitting on the fence, I kind of use both, and it's just more about what I'm feeling most confident and what I feel in the groove with the most, but I would say on the whole, when I'm walking, it would be more of a mouth read that I would lean toward. Um, using, I just feel like it just is just a more natural um, 
sound and when I'm moving and walking, it just I just feel more in the groove to blow a mouth read and it would be kind of like this. Just maybe something like that, you know, just three calls that are spaced out a little bit and then just let it be. Um, because again, I just think it's very unnatural if all of a sudden you're just blowing 20 calls like a herd, and like you're saying, doing that sequence of a yeah, 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 over and over. It just needs to be just more, in my opinion, just quality sounds. I'm more about making quality sounds than, than making a bunch of noise, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, and I think you made a good point, too. Like when you, you know, you're hyping up a ridge and you get, you get to a saddle and, and when you, you know, slip over the top, like if it's me, I'm going to fight the urge, like, yeah, I want to call and see what's around, but I'm going to slip over, and I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be standing there. I'm going to maybe find some cover where I can just have something behind me, have a backdrop, and just kind of sit there and listen for a little bit. I'm going to fight yeah. the urge to get my call out and just start cranking away, trying to get a response. I'm going to listen first, and I'm going to, you know, take assess the situation, kind of take it all in, kind of you know, feel what the wind's doing, kind of just listen down in the basin below me, and then I'll be okay. Now it's time to do a little prospecting, you know, either by throwing out a few cow calls, maybe a bugle, maybe both, um, but just be natural. Like, you know, uh, if you, if you, it's very rare to be just sitting there and observing, and all of a sudden, you know, 200 yards away, something just starts going, yeah, 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 and then bugle, and then cow call, you know, Usually it's like a cow, you know, you'll hear a cow sound. And then you'll kind of yeah. perk your ears up and you'll listen and you'll just kind of be sitting there and you'll hear a cow sound again and you'll be like, okay, can something, something. And then maybe you'll hear just kind of a faint bugle. You know, it's really yeah. rare to just be sitting there and observing and all of a sudden, you know, chaos ensues, you know, 200 yards away. I mean, it's super rare. That was exactly the word I was going to say. Yeah, chaos busts out. 200 yards yeah. away from you blows 50 calls all of a sudden yeah absolutely yeah. what about That's like fun. what about like a cast call um how often you know would you be prospecting would you do you know like a lost mew or a lost calf like just a yeah. you know a real high pitch just kind of a uh, you know for me, that seems to work a lot, and if anything's around, either a cow, and a lot of times bulls will bugle at it, um, a calf call, what do you think of that? Yeah, Jay, that is a totally non-threatening sound, so there's no way that you're going to put out a wrong message with that. So I agree, that's a very effective sound that, that yeah, a typical bull is going to bugle at. Um, it's just a shorter kind of higher pitch let me see if I can I know you're a better cow caller than me especially on that calf call but just be kind of short like this <coughs> just something like that yeah shorter yeah. It's not as drawn exactly. it doesn't have quite that two tone sliding note that a that a regular mature cow sounds like? Yeah, I mean, I found that to be very effective, and almost any elk will answer that or come to it. So um, you guys might try that. Let's jump to the next question. Uh, Adam K. Short says, Tactics after monsoon season in previous drought areas, response to podcast 454, um, he says, specifically in New Mexico, Arizona, that were very dry in the summer, but then received a good summer rain. Thanks. I think we covered that a little bit in, in the, you yep. know, earlier in this podcast, talking about, you know, we've, we've been experiencing drought, and, you know, you've got to figure out whether your unit's got, you know, gotten those widespread rains or if it's gotten those spotty rains, and pay particular attention to, um, you know, is it green, uh, do, do, do the bushes look, you know, vibrant and alive, or do they look dull and, you know, look droughted? Um, you know, is the grass, you know, does it have green sprouts and sprigs coming up where it's like, oh, you just drive along and, it, you know, it's got a green tint to it, or does it have a brown tint to it? So 
those are the things that, that I look for. And then specifically, like, find out those areas that are green up, but then get out there and walk through it and drive around it and look for tracks. Like, the tracks don't lie. Like, if, 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 if you don't see tracks, then you don't have elk. If you, if you can make a circle out in that country and you're like, oh, there's cow-calf track, there's cow track, oh, there's bull track, there's a bull and a cow, then it's like, okay, elk are here, you know. And if you can tell how fresh they are, you know, if you can go off of fresher tracks, you know, is it in the mud, is it an old track, or, you know, is it real soft? you know, you can tell, oh, there's elk right here. They were, they've been here within the last 24 hours. I mean, that's what I would focus on. Steve, anything to add to that? Great advice. That, that, that is spot on, Jay, all of that. Because, yeah, first off, you're looking for the green up, and then secondarily, absolutely, you're looking for that fresh elk sign, tracks, droppings. Um, you know, if there's, if there's ponds or tanks around, looking for elk sign around that. Um, and I always say, if you can find cows and calves, the bulls are going to be there during the rut. So in my opinion, it's more important um, to find those cow-calf groups and where that good habitat is, where they're hanging out, because those bulls, when they feel the rut coming on, that's where they're going to end up, is in those better areas with those cow-calf groups. So you're exactly right. Uh, next question is Benzilla480. He says, should I be concerned about the early morning thermals carrying my scent down into canyons and drainages I'm glassing into? What is a safe distance to not be detected by scent? That's a good question and, and good to be thinking about that. One thing I would say is, like, if... I look for, like, rocky knobs and I look for, like, obscure, like, like, kind of out of the ordinary glassing points, not necessarily like right in the elk country. I like to kind of be away from it and looking into it. Yes. Um, if you are up on like in Colorado or Utah or Montana or, or you know, some of Idaho, some of these states where like there's, you know, more like ridge lines and you're like right in the elk, then yeah, I think you'll always have to be concerned with your scent. Um, but, yep. you know, that's something that if they're there, they're going to smell like, if you know they're there, like, don't go specifically glass in an area where you know your scent's going to blow down in a basin. But from, a, say, an Arizona or New Mexico or a Nevada standpoint or maybe even southern Utah where you can get away from the elk up on a rocky knob or up on a mountain and be looking like, uh, you know, half mile to three miles away, obviously your scent is not going to affect those animals at all. Um and I like to kind of get away from it and look into it rather than be right in the middle of it and looking into it, if that makes sense. Um, absolutely. Steve, any, any thoughts on the scent there? Yeah, elk, their first line of defense is their nose, and you cannot overrate their nose. If you have a thermal, like in the mornings, like he's talking about, that is just steadily going downhill, I, I wouldn't want to predict a, a specific range, but they can smell you a lot further than you would think. And I guarantee you, if you set up and there was elk below you, say they were, were even three quarters to a mile away, and you sat there for a while with those thermals just blowing across you and going down to them, I guarantee within you know several seconds to you know 20 seconds or whatever, by the time that thermal carried down to them, they would they would get you. They they would nail you. Yeah. And I think it would be without regard to how careful you are about your scent and how meticulous you are about it. It like you say, if there's any way to avoid being in that, you know, thermal stream that's going to those elk, if you can be off to the side some way, um, you know, uh, in a rocky spot. Um, that's, that's, that's not going to carry your scent directly down the hill to them. I w yeah, I would not risk it because once they all get your scent, they're, they're out of there and their pattern is going to change. They're not like a deer. They're not going to go for a couple, couple hundred yards and settle back down. They may go to a completely different basin, and, and then you're trying to find them again. Yeah, for sure. Next question is from Leah underscore Margarita, and she says, what can a late rifle tag holder be doing to prep for that hunt right now, specifically in the White Mountains? Steve, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, I would say first off is um, don't ignore the physical aspect of that hunt. 
I know there's a lot of glassing involved and people can easily overlook the physical side of it, but then when it comes time to actually go on the stock and, you know, get an elk killed, it can be a daunting thing and it can be very physical and especially if you don't live at the elevation that these elk live at, if you're coming from, you know, say the Phoenix area and you're going up to hunt the White Mountains, um, I would say definitely focus on your cardiovascular fitness, um, you know, and also doing some high rep weight training to strengthen your legs and your core um, just so that you're ready to take that on um, because the physical side of it can't be overemphasized. And then also, um, I always say that these late hunts, long-range shooting is the norm and not the exception. You're usually shooting at them across canyons or you're on the side of a mountain shooting at them on another mountain that's across a draw from you or something. So, um, you know, whenever possible, we always try to get as close as possible. But in late season hunting, that's usually very hard to do because you end up on the same side hill with them and they're standing there in brush and you get over on the same hill with them and you can't see them again until you're less than 50 yards away. So I would say make sure that you've got a, you know, a quality bolt action rifle that's, you know, made for long range shooting. Um, you know, and a, you know, I typically recommend a good Magnum caliber 270 mag and higher 7mm 300. Um, you know, if, if, if the recoil bothers you, a muzzle brake, or if you, if you can, a suppressor uh, is definitely an advantage. And then, and then a scope um, with a turret or extra hashtags with a good magnification, you know, like, say, 16 power top end or higher, because um, it can't be overemphasized enough that, that you're going to be shooting long range most of the time. So I guess it goes without saying, get that gun out now and start practicing with it. Um, you know, obviously starting out shooting on the bench, figuring out what load your gun likes and is accurate with, and then, um, you know, if there's any way possible, get out in the field in some, you know, real hunting situations with your pack, practice shooting prone with that rifle, practice shooting off of sticks, um, you know, just, just make it as real world as you can so that you're, you're ready, and if you, you know, have that great shot opportunity, um, it doesn't end in heartbreak, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, for sure, and I'm going to add, like, uh, so if you have, uh, you know, a late season tag, and she's talking about specifically in the White Mountains, but just in general, I mean, this is what I do when I draw a tag. Um, I'm going to find my unit boundaries. I'm going to go on Google Earth. I'm going to, uh, all my boundaries of the unit are outlined in a certain color. I take all of my highways. They're always green. I make all my roads white. I'm basically making a master map for me of the unit. Um, yeah. I'm trying to identify any water holes, whether it be trick tanks, dirt tanks, uh, you know, uh, stream beds. Uh, uh, I'm trying to identify, you know, glassing areas, not only glassing, you know, points that I'm going to be glassing off of, but areas that look good on the map as far as, you know, the late season, it's going to be north or northeast facing slopes. Um, typically where they can get feed and then be back into the cover for uh, safety very quickly. Um, so I'm going to be doing a lot of map work. Um, the other thing I'm going to be doing, Leah, is, uh, you know, go up. If you're not familiar with your unit, go drive the unit. I always say try and drive every yeah. single road in the unit. Um, yeah. I know that sounds crazy, but literally try and familiarize yourself with every aspect of your unit. Uh, be, you know, paying attention to, hey, where would a good place to camp be, you know, and have eight or 10 or 12 different spots to camp, depending on where you find your elk. Um, yep. You know, where are my access points as far as, you know, in, in the White Mountains, in rougher weather, like, you know, certain roads might be closed, um, you know, uh, looking for areas that are, you know, maybe away from the road. Um, with good cover, uh, you know, and good water. Um, and, you know, I think knowing your area, knowing your unit, but then talk to as many people that you know or that you don't know. Call Forest Service guys. Bug the Game and Fish guys. Um, yes. You know, call and, and, and meet people that have hunted the unit and take your topo maps over and be like, you know, where did you camp? Okay, what roads? You know, where will most people camp? Where did you see the most pressure? Um, you know, 
Where are pockets where you didn't see people? Are there any uh, glassing points that, that you identified in your hunt? And, you know, talk to people. And, um, you know, a lot of people are willing to share information, uh, you know, that will help you on your hunt. Uh, so those are some of the things that, that, that I would be doing. And, Steve, I agree with what you were saying as well. Uh, next yeah. question is bow, hunt, bow hunting AZ uh, ask OTC Verde Valley hunt any tips etc. It puts a picture of, of archery, so obviously he wants to do it with the bow. I had some other questions on this OTC Verde Valley hunt, um, and I, I kind of went back and forth with a with a guy. First thing is like find the elk. I think it's already started. I think it started August first. Um, obviously yeah. this is an OTC, it's a depredation type hunt, like they want to kill the elk, um, you're probably going to have lots of other people and what have you, but I mean, let's make it simple, like you have to find the elk first, um, uh, someone was asking me calling advice for this Verde Valley hunt, and I'm like, well, have you found any elk yet, like don't worry about yeah. calling, worry about finding them first finding where they're hitting water, find out where they're bedding, find out, you know, get up high. What I would do, I've never been on this hunt. I have no idea where the elk would be. I would try to get up as high as I can, glass, and try and find them first. Um, so that would be the tip that I would give you and completely know that it's going to be tough. Yeah, I completely agree with that, Jay, because if there's no elk there, all the calling in the world, you're not going to get a response if, if there's not an elk there. So I absolutely agree with everything you just said there. Look for the best habitat. That's going to be a good start. Look for that good feed. Um, obviously, water sources because elk have to have both, and, the, and then and then you know some cover where they can bed. You find those three things in proximity to each other, and you likely will find elk, and then you can start narrowing it down from, from that point. But, yeah, you're spot on yeah. with that. And I'm like you, I have no experience with that, so to tell them, you know, where to go or any of that, I wouldn't have any sort of knowledge of, about specifics that way. Yeah, and, I mean, go find fresh tracks. I mean, that's, like, find the elk, either by glassing them, hearing them, or finding their tracks. And if you can consistently find fresh tracks, eventually you will figure out how to glass them up and figure out what they're doing. Steve, I'm going to end here with um, two questions from the same guy. It's uh, the underscore rugged underscore wild. Uh, and he says, I have an early archery bull tag here in Arizona. Uh, what are some strategies for solo elk calling? So I'll, I'll let you dive into that. But so he's, so, he's going to hunt solo, so he's going to be doing his own calling. Um, what's your answer yeah. to that, Steve? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing for him, obviously we talked about the wind and distance, and, and the biggest thing to me when you're calling for yourself is realizing how good a bull's depth perception is, and you have to take that into account. So first off, you want to be hunting the kind of terrain that's thick enough that you can call them in, and they have to continue to come to look for your calling location because of their depth perception. And then secondly, I would say, and I'm kind of guilty of this, Jay, I'm, I'm kind of guilty of this, but you don't want to overcall if you're calling by yourself because you want that bull as he's approaching to be guessing a little bit. So if you've got him committed and he's coming in, normally the best thing you can do at that point is just to be quiet and let him come in and look for you. And inevitably, you know, they're, they're going to make a mistake and they're going to walk across broadside in front of you and you're going to get a shot. Um, you know, I would say definitely, um, if you can, if, you, if you're a diaphragm uh, reed caller, that's a great scenario because you've got that reed in your mouth. If you've got your release knocked up on your string, you don't have to, to move to blow an open reed call. Um, so, you know, hopefully he's, he's a mouth reed user. If not, I still think you can get by with an open reed call. Just knowing when to, you know, stop the calling and get your release on the string, that, that will be key. Um, and then also he might even, you know, consider looking into those, uh, you know, bow-mounted type decoys that, that you can literally shoot through. Um, although I wouldn't, you know, place the whole hunt on whether he can do that or not. The main thing, again, is just recognizing that they have great depth perception, so you've got to pick your setups well to where it's thick enough 
that they've got to come in and get within archery range to see your calling location. And then by not overcalling, they're going to look for you, and, and inevitably they'll offer you a shot if you're if you're patient. Yeah, and I I would also add, you know, as much as the solo elk calling question, if you're hunting by yourself, you have a great advantage in my mind in one regard because you're only one person, one piece of scent, you know, piece of noise, you know, you can flip around, but. I would encourage you to take Steve's advice and get really close to those elk. And when you're by yourself, you can really slip in and close that distance before you do any calling. I've yep. always said, like, almost into bow range. I, and I've said it to, I've said it on the podcast. I've told people that have emailed me, like, if I can get into 50 or 60 yards of a bull elk, my chances of calling him to 20 or 30 is almost 100%. Like, if yeah. you can get in close, say, you know, 60 to 80 yards, but if I can get into 50 or 60 yards and I can cow call to that bull, personally, I, I'm, I'm more of a cow caller, my chances of calling him to 15 or 20 yards go up dramatically as opposed to if I'm calling to him at 120 yards. I totally so agree. That's a, that's a benefit of hunting by yourself is you don't have to do a whole lot of calling because you can slip right in there and then you can make a few calls and, you know, in two or three yeah. seconds they can close from 60 to 20 and you've got your 20-yard shot. Yeah, if you need to call, absolutely, I agree, Jay. And and call like you do, Jay, when you're close to a bull like that and you haven't said anything, it needs to come out subtle and sweet and soft, not loud and harsh and aggressive. It needs to just be nice and soft and easy. Baby talk them like you. Jay, you're so good at that. So, yeah. Baby talk, I, baby. Baby talk, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, the last question is from, from the Rugged Wild as well, and he says, what should I do, and this is our last question, what should I do now to be prepared if my goal is to be a guide in three to five years? Great question. Steve? Yeah, that is a great question. My first piece of advice would be pursue it. If that's what you love and that's your passion, um, I think everybody has the right to pursue what they would love to do. Um, so I would encourage him to do that. My second piece of advice would be to keep his foundation, whatever that happens to be, under him. So right now, keep your regular job. Um, still dream about and make plans to be a guide and, you know, work on your calling, work, work on your, your hunting skills. Um, you know, to these days, it's a lot about social media as far as getting your name out there and your reputation out there. Um, so I think, you know, be having a, a, a good social media presence is very important as well um, to get that going um, just to show that he's the real deal, if you know what I'm saying, Jay. But I would yeah. say the main thing is keep that foundation under you. Whatever you're doing right now to pay your bills and keep that roof over your head, don't be real quick to kick that to the curb because it could be, you know, a real rude awakening for you um, in that, you know, guiding is definitely not an overnight thing for sure. Um, and, you know, most of us don't do it for the money. Um, gosh, I've been doing this since the 90s, and it's really honestly developed, I would say, fairly slowly over the years. Um, so, so just keep your feet underneath you, so to speak, and just uh, build it you know, slowly, one step at a time. Um, but I think these days, yeah, having social media and having a strong presence on there can't be overstated. Um, and then I would also say make intelligent posts. <laughs> would you agree with that, Jay? Um, you know, make, oh, make it yeah. a, uh, spot on. Create value. What, like create, yeah. create value. And, and listen, my advice, it, it's, it seems the older I get, the more not like – my wife's like, you get so direct sometimes, and it's like, hey, don't quit your day job. You know, continue to get your education, continue whatever you're doing, uh, yep. continue to work your job. But then, okay, you want to be an elk guide. I would say, hey, learn as much as you can from people. Okay, you can learn something from anyone, whoever it is. Find some good mentors that can teach you how, how to be a good guide. 
Absolutely. Just because you're a good hunter does not mean you're a good guide. And that's one thing, you know, I was young once and I see a lot of young guys, they think just because they're a great hunter themselves that they're going to be a great guide. That has nothing to do with it. Just because you're a great shot, just because you can walk super quiet does not mean you're going to be a great guide. Just because you can be a great elk caller does not mean you're going to be a great guide. How do you handle people? How do you Absolutely. handle when the situation doesn't go well? How do you handle when your hunter misses the shot? How do you handle yourself when things don't go the correct way? How do you, yeah. you, know, um, you have to be mature. You have to come into it with a level of humility. Um, you, you have to realize that the reason that the person hired you is because they are not, they either don't have time to do the scouting. They don't know how to hunt. That's why they hired you. There are some people that are great hunters that do hire guides uh, because maybe they don't know the area. But a lot of times it's maybe because they're not as good a hunter and they want to learn. So you have to provide value when it comes to social media. Like post positive stuff. Don't post negativity. Um, yeah, you know, right. if, if you want to be a great guide, like, no, spend time in your units. Learn the units inside and out. Because you've killed one elk does not mean you're going to be a great guide. Like, I, I, I would rather have someone that's never killed an elk, but he knows the unit inside and out, and he's, you know, he's full of humility and yes, um, he realizes that he can learn from lots of people, and he he's quick to listen and not quick to talk. Um, I totally agree, uh, Jay. That is good advice because I think that the personal personality side of it is more important. And if you don't have that side of it, then the hunting ability all goes by the wayside. And I feel like we are all the sum total of who we have you know, learn from and idolize, so to speak, in the past. And I feel by no mean, means am I, you know, who I am because of myself. I feel like it's because I've, I've learned and I've been open to learning from people. You know, everybody out there has got something to offer uh, regardless of how they approach it. Um, so, yeah, again, I feel like I'm just the sum total of all of that and staying humble and realizing that, you know, the minute that you think you're great and know-it-all, you're going to be humbled out there in the woods. And uh, you're exactly right. You, when you're out there guiding, you're going to be spending a week to two weeks with people. So the personal side of it is very important because, you know, like it or not, you're either going to have a best friend at the end of that hunt, which is what you're hoping for, or you're going to have somebody who didn't enjoy being around you um, because you don't have that humility and uh, just that genuine uh, part of you. So, um, what you yeah. said, Jay, is spot. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, uh, people, you know, Steve, you and I have been doing this a long time and it's, it hasn't always been easy and there's been lots of struggles. And you, what you see is you see all the good stuff and you see all the quote unquote glory, but you don't see all the in the trenches and the years of, you know, dealing with all sorts of situations. But, you know, you have to go into it with the mentality of I'm I'm I have the fortune to guide this hunter on the hunt, and I'm going to try and do everything that I can to provide the best opportunity and the best experience for that hunter. And you have to realize that sometimes those hunters that that hire you, they can't see as well as you do. They can't hear as well as you do. They're not as in shape as you are. They they don't have the the knack that you have. You have to understand that you have to be above and beyond and bring value to their situation. Uh, and, yep. and, you know, like I said, come with a level of humility of we can't walk as fast. We can't hike as fast. We can't, you know, we have, and, and do it with a smile on your face and embrace it That's and say, you're, you're absolutely. doing great. Encourage your client. You, you're doing fantastic. You know, if there's a time when they need a kick in the butt, then there's a time for that. But if, if all you've been is a jerk, they're not going to listen to you. But if you've been encouraging and say, I know we have yep. to go up this hill pretty fast right now, and I know it's going to hurt, and I know you're going to suffer, but we have to do this to get to the top, to be in the right position, 
and, you know, give them the wink and the thumbs up. Don't walk 50 yards ahead of them and look back like, what are you doing? Like, you yeah. have to bring yeah. value to, to the client. You should write a book on that, Jay. Everything you just said is, is <laughs> so good. It's seriously, so good. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. You've got to make it fun at the end of the day. It's, it's, you know, not that your client's a kid, but if you make it no fun for a new hunter who's a kid, they're, they're not going to like it and they're not going to do it again. Same way with a client. If you make it fun for them, have a glass half full mentality instead of a glass half empty. Um, you know, I, I like to say never make excuses. Um, it is what it is and just continue on with a smile, whether it be other hunters messing your hunt up, dealing with people who are rude out there, which can happen. Um, you just, you just keep things on the up and up and keep some pep in your step. Keep a smile on your face. Think positive, talk positive, and act positive, and positive things will happen for you out there. Good stuff, Steve. Well, this has been a great podcast. Uh, I want to give you a chance to let the listeners know how they can uh, find out about more about you, how they can reach you, um, all your contact info. I'll also link it up in the show notes. Oh, you bet, Jay. Thanks so much. It's been great being on with you. So um, first off, they can go on to my website to learn more about the guide service at chapelguideservice.com, or they can, if they want more information on the Zero Hunt Fees program, zerohuntfees.com. And then uh, I also have an Instagram page that is Elk Camp TV. Um, and typically what I do is my posts also go on to Facebook, which is Chapel Guide Service. Um, but I would say Instagram is the best and easiest way to find me. Again, that's at Elk Camp TV. And then if they have Direct TV or Dish Network, I would highly encourage them to, to uh, and I'd appreciate their support watching the show, Elk Camp. And new episodes air every Monday at noon Eastern time. So whatever your time is, adjust for that. And then on Saturdays, um, it airs at 9.30 Eastern Time, so that'd be 6.30 Pacific or 7.30 Mountain Time a.m. is when it airs. And then it also airs a couple of times during the week, but late night. So typically, I'd say for most people, either Mondays or Saturdays would be the best time to see it. Uh, and then a new episode starts every week. So I appreciate everyone's um, support and encouragement in that, and uh, hopefully that will continue um, and go past one season. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, I um, hope you have a bang-up year in Unit 1 and, and uh, look forward to uh, maybe catching up with you mid-season and seeing how it's going. And uh, always a good uh, elk hunt in Colorado. So uh, best, of, uh, best of, of the hunt for you guys. And um, God bless you, man. Thanks for all that you do. And uh, thanks for your friendship. And uh, thanks for the value that you've uh, created over the years with your videos and now with your TV show. Oh, thank you so much, Jay. It's been great to be your friend for <laughs> over two decades, and um, it's so great to always be on your podcast. As always, um, appreciate your listeners, and hopefully they got something of value out of this, uh, Lord willing, and, and God bless you. Thanks again for having me on. All right, buddy. Take care. I'll catch you later.